first time, a biosimilar version of the world's best-selling medicine, Humirum, has become available in the United States. Biosimilars are variants of brand name biologic medicines, such as Humira, that are supposed to yield the same health outcome, but at a lower cost. This has been a widely anticipated event with the advent of biosimilars just a few years ago in the US. The bottom line question here is, will it really benefit the patient or just the companies who do the behind the scenes dealing that help determine what the pricing looks like. Humira has been a huge seller for the manufacturer, Abbey, which has racked up billions in dollars of sales from this one medicine alone. It's used to treat various autoimmune disorders, starting with rheumatoid arthritis, but other ailments such as Crohn's disease. It's a go-to medicine for doctors and it's been extremely helpful to patients. For that reason, it's also generated a tremendous amount of interest among other companies in the pharmaceutical industry which have been angling to be able to sell their own biosimilar versions in the United States. But there's an open question about the extent to which a biosimilar, and particularly a biosimilar version of Humira, will actually lower health care costs in the United States. This gets complicated and weedy because in general, pharmaceutical pricing is opaque. Calculations and machinations behind the pricing system are done behind closed doors. So it's very difficult generally to know exactly how much savings can be obtained from certain medicines based on the actual costs. But more important, or just as important, are the negotiations between the pharmaceutical manufacturers and the companies that represent the health insurance system because that is where the rubber meets the road. That is where the actual pricing gets set for a medicine before a patient goes to the pharmacy counter. And it's in that unknown little gray area where the most important decisions about pricing are actually made. There's an interesting development though with Humira that has gotten some attention and I'll take a moment to explain. Patents are coveted by pharmaceutical companies because they give them an opportunity for exclusive marketing rights before other companies' competition can win the right to sell a competing version of that same medicine. The key patent on Humira expired in 2016, roughly seven years ago. So why haven't we seen a biosimilar, lower cost biosimilar version before then? The answer is patent thickening. It sounds like a wonky term and it is, but basically, it involves a pharmaceutical company with a best-selling product in this case, defending its patents. And it does that by filing dozens, hundreds even, patents that can be used to deflect competition more so. In this case, that's what Abbey did. It filed many patents that in some cases extended its monopoly for a dozen years or more. So instead of having the opportunity for competitors to sell their own versions in 2016, the companies were forestalled by Abbey's maneuvering. And how did that play out? The other companies that I mentioned that want to sell biosimilar versions of Humira won regulatory approval from the Food and Drug Administration. But then when they moved to be able to sell their versions, Abbey turned around and filed patent infringement lawsuits against each of those companies. And that's a very time-consuming and expensive process to endure. So one by one, as each company encountered litigation with Abby, they eventually capitulated and reached settlements. And the agreement was that they would not have a chance to sell a biosimilar version in the United States until 2023, a seven-year difference in which Abby was able to rack up billions of dollars in sales every year. So here we are today. It's 2023 and the first biosimilar is now available in the United States. The new biosimilar version that's just become available is from a company called Amgen. But how do we get to the actual idea of savings? Will that materialize? What might that look like? In general, this all comes down to a very behind the scenes, somewhat understood, but always mysterious process involving rebates. To people inside the industry, it's a simple concept, but it's actually very complicated. I'll try to break it down very, very easily. What happens typically, a drug company has a medicine, it wants to win 
insurance coverage who wants to make sure that health plans that work on behalf of employers, whether it's government or private companies, will cover the medicine. So how does that happen? The coverage is determined by something called the formulary. That's the list of medicines for which health insurance provides coverage. But how does a medicine get onto the formulary? And how does a medicine get a favored status? Because most formularies have what are known as different tiers or levels of coverage. Until that's decided, what happens behind the scenes is the pharmaceutical company will negotiate with another company that works on behalf of the health plans. That company is called a pharmacy benefit manager or PBM. So the drug company has a medicine, it wants coverage, it talks to the PBM. How do I get the best placement on the formulary? So what happens? The drug company will pay, typically pay what's known as a rebate. It'll actually pay a fee to get the best placement. And that fee gets passed along through the chain. As prices rise in this country, the pharmaceutical manufacturers blame the PBMs and health plans. Why? Well, we have to pay larger rebates to get a bigger, a better placement on the formulary. The PBMs say, no, the pharmaceutical companies raise their prices to, in order to ensure they get a bigger profit. Well, the reality is that, again, we don't really know what the numbers look like, but we do know that this is the reason that we see prices rise. And that process doesn't really benefit patients. This behind the scenes process results in formulary placement and coverage for a medicine. Humira is really no different. And with so many different companies about to sell biosimilar versions, you would think with more competition, the rebating would result in lower prices. That may or may not happen just that way. Amgen is trying a maneuver where it actually has two discounts. They're offering a 5% discount off the wholesale price and a 55% discount off the wholesale price. So you would think that, gee, a lower wholesale price would appeal to the PVM and their health plan clients, but not really. The medicine will sell for less money, and that means there are, there's less money in the way of fees to pass along through the insurance chain. But if you only take a 5% discount, that means the medicine sells for more, and there's a bigger percentage fee that passes through that insurance, health insurance chain. For this reason, the 5% deal is more likely to be the kind of arrangement that will appeal to the pharmacy benefit managers and health plans, but that's also a higher price. This, this scenario that we're seeing play out with Amgen's biosimilar version of Humira really contradicts what people expected when biosimilar versions first became available in the United States several years ago. At that time, there is hope not just expectation, that we would see 20% discounts, 30% discounts off the list price of the brand name Biologic. But in this case, we're only seeing a 5% discount. And that's a far cry from the 20 or 30% figures that were expected. If, if you think it's complicated so far, it gets a little more complicated. Another key factor that will determine the extent to which a biosimilar version of Humira is widely prescribed is called interchangeability. That's a regulatory designation, a designation made by the Food and Drug Administration. The Amgen version that's just out is not interchangeable. It does not have that designation by the FDA. That means for the time being, AbbVie and, and its Humira still have a leg up on Amgen's biosimilar version. So even though we now have the first biosimilar version of Humira, this is really a test case for the extent to which biosimilars can yield savings to the U U.S. healthcare system. The next several months, as we see more biosimilar versions of Humira arrive in the market, will provide great insight or sufficient insight to understand how this process can play out with still other drugs in coming years. Ultimately, this will hopefully, or it should, provide an opportunity to better understand how biosimilars can help the patient. It's something to watch very closely for the indefinite future.